Hi everyone. My presentation covers the respiratory system. I'm Heather Herdell. All right, so respiration. Cells use oxygen for cell cellular metabolism. Obviously, we need oxygen to, to live, and it's a misnomer because it was once thought that everything incurred in the lungs instead of the cells, the cells throughout our entire body. Here we have a diagram of the pulmonary system. We have the upper tract seen here and the lower tract. So the upper tract adds water vapor, warmth that traps debris in the cilia. Um, the lower tract, that's where gas exchange occur occurs in the alveoli between the pulmonary capillaries. There's uh, quite a high surface area of the alveoli and if we could spread it all out, the surface area would be the same about half of a tennis court. So quite a bit. Ventilation or breathing. So we have the diagram on the, under the rib cage. It's the so we have the diaphragm. That's the muscle under the rib cage. It controls um, the, vol the volume of the thorax and it changes inner pulmonary pressure. It's passive at rest, but during exercise that's active and also the accessory and respiratory muscles assist um, with the motion. We have the dead space, that's the remaining breath um, left and does not exchange um, gases. And that dead space does increase slightly during exercise. And then also, as we already know, ventilation increases substantially during exercise. Okay, here on the top left, we have a diagram of lung capacity. Right here, this is um, the maximum, if you had a maximal inhale and exhalation, and underneath we have the residual volume, the volume. Right here is a normal tidal breath, and then the um, re inspiratory reserve volume and expiratory reserve, reserve volume right underneath. On the bottom right, we have the um, partial pressures of oxygen and carbon dioxide. After accounting for water vapor, partial um, pressure of oxygen is about 150 millimeters of mercury at 21%, and that's only about 0.2 millimeters mercury of carbon dioxide, um, being that it's such a small percentage, and that's seen here on the chart. So um, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide increases, this is expiration right here, and decreases for oxygen, and it's higher um, after inspiration. Ventilation is measured in liters per minute. The total volume of gas entering lungs in a minute is the tidal volume times the respiratory rate. The tidal volume being the average volume of air moved on each ventilatory excursion, um, and the respiratory rate is how, frequent, how frequently you're breathing in a minute. All right, so ventilation is measured with a spirometer, the device that you breathe into, and it um, measures the volume of air and also water vapor. It's simply the movement of air into and out of the pulmonary system. There's four functions of ventilation. First, the exchange of oxygen, that's the most um, important. Also, the exchange of carbon dioxide, control of uh, blood acidity. Bicarbonates are the, what is responsible for the pH drop. Um, and then finally, oral communication, that's not performance related, although it is important to note that even during high intensity exercise, um, for say team sports, the players are still able to communicate even when they're breathing pretty hard because of the residual volume. Okay, so the exchange of gases. Oxygen and carbon dioxide carbon dioxide move from high to low pressure and concentration, so that goes along with the your basic concentration gradient. Partial pressure is the pressure exerted by an individual gas and together um, the partial pressures would add together to make the total um, total pressure. Carbon dioxide is 20 times more soluble than oxygen. That's important because it's a carbon dioxide is a byproduct, and it's more efficient to get rid of that byproduct if it's more soluble. 
Here's a diagram of gas exchange. Here you see the a single alveolus and the capillary over here on the right. So the after an inspiration, the oxygen is going from the alveolus into the capillary and carbon dioxide is leaving the cell, um, the capillary, I'm sorry, and going back to the alveolus to be exhaled. There is a short distance for diffusion that's important um, for quick and efficient diffusion. So in alveoli, partial pressure of oxygen is about 105 millimeters of mercury. Carbon dioxide has about, it's about 40 millimeters of mercury. Oxygen remains about, at about 100 millimeters of mercury during exercise at sea level. So it's relatively constant. Arterial partial pressure of oxygen is key controlled variable. So that's more controlled than carbon dioxide and also um, the pH. Although those, are, those other two are still very important. Right, here's the diagram of the pressure of carbon dioxide compared to the total um, amount of carbon dioxide in the blood. So here we see it's relatively linear as um, partial pressure of carbon dioxide increases, so does the total amount of, of carbon dioxide in the blood. The normal, normal range is about 35 to about 43 um, millimeters of mercury in this darker shaded area. It increases pretty constantly. Oxygen transport. So the Bohr effect facilitates unloading of oxygen from hemoglobin of blood passing through active muscle beds. Um, hemoglobin transports oxygen. Um, carbon dioxide reacts as water and it the when in the erythrocyte. Um, and 70% of carbon dioxide transported in form of, um, is in the form of bicarbon ion. So the car um, carbonic acid dissociates and leaves that extra um, high proton, the hydrogen, by itself. And that's what decreases the pH. Unless it is um, buffered away, Okay, in this diagram we'll see um, more of the Bohr effect. So at a lower pH and a higher temp, we have a rightward shift of the curve. So as oxygen is high, the pressure of oxygen is high um, in the alveoli, um, we have a high saturation in the, of the hemoglobin. But as the, the blood is carried to cells that are deoxygenated, um, then it has a, a lower affinity for the oxygen and it gives it away to the cells that need it. And that, that makes sense um, in general and that's very efficient. But that is changed by pH and temperature. And that, so that would happen during high intensity or a duration of exercise. Also you'll see on this diagram there's a a smaller um, arterial and venous oxygen difference for the black line, which is the exercise um, exercising individual, compared to at rest. Right, affinity for oxygen, I just mentioned that. When pressure of oxygen is low in tissue, hemoglobin gives away the oxygen to continue that gradient, the high to low concentration gradient. So the rate at which the gases will reach equilibrium depends on the capillary transit time and also um, the pr pressure gradient. If there's a higher gradient, the bigger difference between the high and the low values, that, that will facilitate a quicker transit time. Um, so at rest, it's about 0.75 seconds, but that um, drops down to even less than half a second during exercise and that decreases the amount of oxygen at one time that can travel across um, from the capillary or in through the capillaries back to the alveoli to be, um, to be transported. So this is sufficient at sea level 
um, for carbon dioxide. For, oxy for oxygen, um, it's still okay. It's, it's slightly reduced. But for um, higher altitudes, that is insufficient. Okay, uh, ventilation is controlled um, under the thalamus, mainly by the medulla and also by the pons. There's overlapping redundant control, which makes sense considering ventilation is so important and it's vital to live, um, and for cellular respiration. So during exercise, the motor cortex has more, plays more of a role, and arterial chemoreceptors are most important during exercise to give um, feedback and regulate ventilation. There um, is also peripheral input uh, based on chemoreceptors and also mechanoreceptors. It is noted in the Brooks text that researchers are still trying to figure out more on the neural control of ventilation and it's um, rather difficult to study. There are so many um, different aspects of the control centers mm -hmm. that it's really hard to isolate which does wh what. Okay, Exercise, there's plenty of adaptations that occur with ventilation um, during exercise. So to meet the higher energy or oxygen demands, we have an increased stroke vol volume, increased ventilation rate, um, constricted, of, um, constricted veins, which allows more venous return, so we're pushing that blood back. Um, which is carrying the carbon dioxide from the muscles, and that counteracts the low pH, the buildup of those um, hydrogen, the positively charged hydrogen atoms, um, which is decreasing the pH. So doing so buffers that, and long-term adaptations include a higher VO2 max and a more, more efficient cardiorespiratory system. Okay, so the ventilation and perfusion ratio that increases during exercise. Um, ventilation at the same work rate for a trained individual that would actually decrease, um, although during exercise and overall compared to rest, ventilation increases. Um, pulmonary ventilation increases linearly with work rate. Resting pulmonary uh, minute v ventilation volume can increase by 35 times. So if the original was five, um, it will be about 190 liters per minute. So um, for the VEQ, the lower value um, impairs gas exchange. The ideal is about one. Um, so it would be an equal values between um, the air that's reaching the alveoli, the oxygen amount, um, compared to the, um, the oxygen in the, in the blood reaching alveoli. So the cardiac output increases five to six times during exercise. The ability to expand ventilation is greater than the ability to increase oxidative metabolism of the tissues. After reaching the hypoxia or a hypoxic threshold, that value of the um, ventilation perfusion ratio would decrease, and that's the main cause of um, hy hypoxemia. Here's some final thoughts. The respiratory system is well built. It's um, not considered a limiting factor uh, at sea level, but adaptations would occur um, during hy hypoxia. hypoxia. The, the system can stay in even high intensity exercise due to that high, high um, amount of surface area of alveoli. And overall, it's um, not a limiting factor. All right, here are my references, the Brooks text and then the photo credit. And that is all for my presentation. If you have any questions, I'll see those in the discussion board. Thank you.